Уважаемые гости и участники форума. Само включается. Ну, слава богу. Окей. So it's automatically turned on. Good afternoon, dear friends, colleagues. Five years. Five years. This is a hallmark date. Five years. Five years old is the Moscow Financial Forum and following a good tradition is being held on the Financiers' Day, a holiday, a festivity for the people who all and always and for everything are blaming for, but without him, probably, the life is just impossible. Therefore, we'll start to this forum with the words of congratulations to all the financiers who are working today and who are performing their duty for the country. The plenary session is always about uh, the constellation of superstars, outstanding specialists in the area of uh, economics, uh, financial, civil servants, the politicians. And this is not by accident that I said this word, the politicians, because all these people 
do participate in the development of or in making decisions, and they're responsible for these decisions. The plenary session of the forum is the place where they share with everyone why these decisions are taken. Therefore, I will not introduce each of them. I will not even name their positions. I do think that everyone who is present on that podium do not need any introduction. Let me just list them. Anton Silonov, Sergei Sobyanin, Maxim Oreshkin, Rush Maxim Roshetnikov, Alexei Kudrin. There is no need to name their official positions, uh, just in order to list them and to list what these people did for the country, probably the whole time of the forum won't be enough. And finally, I think that this forum always discusses uh, most crucial issues for the country and for the economy. And this is what the forum is about to do. We are just beginning our work, but the main achievement of the forum has already been made today. We have gathered here all together. We are all fed up and tired of all these online meetings. And when we have gathered today offline, this is our main achievement. And I do hope that for the next year, next year, in the room, there won't be people in medical masks, in PPEs. Let's agree on that, uh, Andre. And uh, Mr. Silianov agrees with that. And now I'd like to invite to that podium probably the main guests, the main participants in our plenary session, Prime Minister of the Russian Federation, Mikhail Mishustin. Good afternoon, dear friends. Well, I'm the guest today, but I'm not the main guest. The main guest here is Mr. Siluanov and all of you, dear colleagues, who work in the sphere of finance, and I believe it's very important. Uh, and uh, Anton is uh, the guard of macroeconomic stability, can uh, help us how to strike the balance between the investment, the budget, right? Well, in essence, we have gathered for that. Thank you. Thank you, dear friends. Uh, I'm glad to welcome you all to the Moscow Financial Forum. It is held in early autumn, as usual, and for the fifth time we meet in person. Five years is not much. The forum is very young, but it has already proved to be useful, and this venue gives us an opportunity to discuss the most relevant goals in the sphere of finance and work on ideas and solutions which would allow us to develop projects and move forward, definitely. Early this year, I have already said that uh, we have uh, passed a tipping point in the COVID-19 cost crisis and expressed confidence that the situation would turn around gradually. What has come next proved just that, and the measures taken by the government uh, on the instructions given by the president uh, have delivered the results that we've expected. Substantial support, uh, which we have provided, and by the way, last year, um, Russia made it up to one of the G20 leaders in terms of expenditure growth, helped mitigate the impact of the pandemic. And by the way, that didn't damage the fiscal stability, which is very important, by the way. Such economic resilience is a result of a systemic work, and we have managed to create a predictable economic climate and uh, conditions uh, for helping people and uh, companies. The government continues to provide support this year, too. For instance, extra money was given to school children's parents, and now, in line with the president's decision, all Russian pensioners, including those who still work and do military service, will receive a one-off payment, 10,000 rubles worth, and the military will get 15,000 rubles. These steps require much money nationwide. And the state has got this extra money as a result of restoring the economy. We have helped business to cope with the COVID-19 caused adverse effects and propped up various industries, small and systemic companies. We've taken measures to create favorable conditions at markets, including energy markets, and eased 
administrative burden by limiting the number of business inspections and audits. And today I would like to say that the government decided to extend the moratorium on routine inspections for small enterprises to cover next year. And uh, by the way, it was you, Andre, who asked the president this question at the meeting with the United Russia members. And the head of state held with it. And now we are drafting uh, the government's decree. The moratorium will cover about 100,000 small enterprises. And all these actions brought much more revenue to the budget. By late August, it was almost a third higher than last year. And it's very important that uh, this is true for the federal budget and for the regional as well, which means better opportunities for the regions. And I would like to point out that our economy rebounded back in June with the GDP reaching its pre-pandemic level. And in the future, we will definitely have to reckon with COVID-19. And it is too early to say that we have seen it off. We will continue to fight for the life and health of our citizens. But even under these circumstances, we can move forward and fulfill large-scale strategic tasks, having higher figures in mind. According to Rostat's preliminary estimates, in the first half of this year, the GDP growth was 4.8 percent. And this growth rate is much higher than the rate that we have cautiously put in the national plan a year ago, and it is above the pre-pandemic level, including in the key non-resource industrial areas like manufacturing industry, for example. Indicators in house and road building have climbed as well, and uh, consumer demand is back to that we used to have. This is supported by the labor market recovery. Rostat estimated that in July the unemployment was 4.5% of the workforce. And uh, by the way, this year, investment demand was a key driver in the economic recovery. In the first half of this year, the investment to the fixed capital surpassed 7%. The head of state clearly defined the priority areas that should get extra funds. And first of all, we should support the people of our country. This is not a one-time measure. It is a long term position that the president and the government has take, have taken, and in the future it will turn into a program that we have been developing. I mean, this is the task that has been fulfilled by the Social Treasury. It will allow us to provide targeted support to the people who will need it, who will need this help from the state for this or that reason. Our citizens should feel the positive dynamic of the economic growth to the full. And we would like to see the two factors come together as soon as possible. I mean the economic development and the prosperity growth. The government will stick to this principle while implementing national development goals defined by the president. We have earmarked big federal funds for that, which according to the preliminary data is about 13 trillion rubles annually. We intend to improve conditions to attract as many private investors as possible to achieve national goals. It is important that these strategies should not be just a list of measures, but they should work for the economy and the Russians so that the citizens would see real, measurable and tangible results. I'm also speaking about a comfortable and affordable medical assistance. Apart from the measures uh, we have been taking in this area, a program called uh, Primary Care for Everyone has been introduced into the package of strategic initiatives which have, has come out recently. It is an improved medical system suggesting individual approach to the needs of every person and uh, the healthcare system in a region as a whole, it will be easier to get such aid and uh, it will take less time to get it. It's very important. 
Regardless of family incomes, uh, children should be able to get a decent education and achieve their potential. And uh, every person should uh, have access to an efficient mechanism of lifelong learning. And if we do give this access and build uh, and equip new educational facilities and train teachers and extend the number of state-funded places in universities, it will help us make it to the top 10 leaders in terms of the quality of general education and uh, R&D work. Moreover, we will establish an effective system of finding, supporting, and developing talented children and uh, young people. The citizens of our country should be confident that they will have jobs that will give them stable and growing income and uh, decent life. And this can be done through maintaining a sustainable economic growth and increasing the number of people working for SMEs, including private entrepreneurs and freelancers. It is important to create a comfortable condition for people, which include new accommodation and affordable infrastructures, outpatient clinics and hospitals, schools and kindergartens, and uh, ecological well-being as well. The president has set a task to improve the housing conditions of no less than 5 million families and put into service no less than 120 million square meters of housing annually by 2030. Meanwhile, the technological development uh, has put in place new requirements for the quality and comfort of uh, an apartment and a house, urban environment and ecology. Persons' interaction with the state bodies uh, should be convenient, simple and transparent. Public services uh, should become a part of daily life. And to this end, uh, we need to inform everyone of new opportunities uh, that arise in a proactive manner. By the way, we have spoken in detail about that today. Once we've got a new service, a person should get information about that rather than look for it on different website or learn about it accidentally or after a while from a neighbor or a colleague. The work that we are going to do will be human-centered. It will be focused on his or her family and its well-being, and raising life standards and health protection, creating comfortable environment to live in. And it's very important to take effort to raise financial awareness. Educational and awareness building programs uh, should uh, make family budgets much more stable and give people knowledge about how and where they'd better put their available resources to get maximum revenue and how to make uh, a so-called rainy day fund or how to save money for something they want to buy. This is in high demand uh, today and we will back the, support, the efforts taken by non-governmental and private organizations in this sphere. We've got convinced how important it is this morning when we met with the supporters of the Finns Ocean Initiative, which is about people who take a responsible approach to financial management. So creating a new financial culture is in the interest of the society itself. This is the reason why we should structure the work so that people themselves would initiate this activity. To do this, we need to involve more people to join, including the representatives of the financial sector. However, we should preserve the coordinating role of the state institutions. And by the way, and I'm addressing to the representatives of the regions, your role is key in this. The government continues uh, to develop the financial market. And this year, for example, we have given a green light to the branches of foreign insurance companies, which in the future will help extend the list of insurance services and uh, make them more affordable and high quality. The business will be able to reduce the risks while striking international deals, uh, and that will have a good impact uh, on the economic activity. Apart from that, the operators of financial pro platforms have got access to the automated information system of third-party liability insurance, and now issuing a relevant contract is part of their list of services. Upon the instruction of the president, we have been working on the fund of funds of advanced industrial and infrastructure technologies. 
It is aimed at two things. First, to increase capital flow into the high-tech projects, and second, support the development of Russian economic industries. It will draw upon the principle of public-private partnership. The government and the Bank of Russia signed off on a roadmap to provide funds for investment projects. It suggests developing equity, debt and hybrid instruments, improving corporate governance in non-public and pension funds, as well as insurance companies, defining the criteria of fast-growing and high-tech companies to give them state support, provided that they have reached a certain level of development. And there are a number of other measures and steps. The implementation of this plan of actions will facilitate the launch of a new investment cycle and uh, attracting new projects and capital into our country. Moreover, we have been developing the financial market development strategy for uh, the next 10 years. Hope we will adopt it and we have involved uh, the representatives of the federal executive bodies, the Bank of Russia, uh, business and academic community. And uh, we're going to discuss it uh, within the government till the end of this year. It will become, become a sector-specific document of strategic planning aimed at defining the main priorities uh, as well as uh, long-term goals and tools which will help us to develop uh, all the financial market sectors. Um, the implementation of this approach uh, will increase its competitiveness, transparency and effectiveness of the financial policy in this area. And to this end, we have enhanced the efficiency of the development institutions so that they would fully participate in achieving national development goals and ensuring the stable uh, economic growth of Russia. Many regulatory and corporate measures were taken and a unified mechanism of corporate governance and risk management of the Web.RF group was established. We have strictly divided roles between development institutions to eliminate competition between them and uh, between them and private investors as well. And the, in upcoming four years, the group is to increase the number of approved projects at least by 70%. And in absolute figures, it should be more than 17 trillion rubles. Direct support should uh, grow twofold as well from 1.5 trillion up to almost 3 trillion rubles and thus the public development institution system will become uh, the backbone infrastructure for the government to attract investment uh, to achieve the national development goals. And uh, our fiscal policy will be also linked to these goals. We have refocused uh, spending and fine-tuned some national and federal projects so that they would steadily lead us to fulfilling the tasks that we have. We have almost finished working with another uh, three-year budget and yesterday saw a meeting of the Budget Commission which approved uh, the social economic outlook and the main features uh, of uh, uh, this financial document. Most importantly, it will provide funds to all top-of-mind areas and primarily social programs. It will also allow us to prop up the economy and help it develop further and achieve the national development goals affirmed by the President. And in due time, the document will be submitted to the State Duma. Now we um, for the adjusting uh, the state programs and the updated versions will enter into force next year. They will follow unified principles of management, which will help us establish a connection between the budgetary line and the entire financing and the end result. The government is intended to, to actively develop the participatory budgeting mechanism and make it more popular, and we have spoken about it today. When citizens participate in defining where to allocate funds uh, uh, from the budgets of different levels and there have been such projects at this forum and this instrument of uh, public funds has been developing intensively and last year there were over 20,000 projects like that. Yes, uh, they are indeed small but uh, they were proposed by people living in towns and villages and they tackle issues which people are indeed concerned with. And there is uh, one more thing that I would like to mention. The achievement of uh, 
National Development Goals uh, requires uh, a modern and flexible governance, governance system. And its main principle, as I have uh, already said, is being human-centered, delivering results for the benefit of people. And we have been building effective communication to this end to get feedback from the people and respond to the issues and propositions in a timely manner. And the president has said that on numerous occasions. Dear friends, I have spoken about several areas of government's activity and presented our position on a number of uh, issues of financial policy. And I'm confident that uh, there will be interesting presentations at the forum. And uh, both you and my colleagues from the government will get many valuable insights to be able to incorporate them later in our plans. I would like to seize the opportunity and convey my best wishes to you on the occasion of the Financial Expert Day. And I would like to thank you for your hard work and responsible approach that you always take. So I wish you fruitful work. Thank you. Good luck. Goodbye. Well, and probably now, the Prime Minister stressed the most important thing. The key thing about all our plans is a man. His problems, issues and needs. And what has already been said about the plans of the government would require a lot of financial investments. If I may, I'd like for the first and for the last time abuse my role as a moderator. Let me ask a question to Mr. Siluanov. Just probably we have to start the financial forum with that. If not, then just probably it won't make any sense. Now, this is a two-faceted question, first of all. Do we have money to support all these initiatives? So that's the 30% of the question. And 70% of the question is whether there is a preparedness to spend this money. Well, Mr. Makarov, once we have money, we are prepared to spend that. And the economy is on the rise. We get budget revenues and more financial resources are channeled to the budget, to the Treasury. We have money, but we have to spend it efficiently in order to get a result. This is what Mr. Mishustin spoke about. The result has to translate into the rise of the economy. And uh, the result is about uh, the growth of the welfare and well-being of our citizens. This would mean that the money is spent efficiently otherwise. Well, as f let's discuss the opposite case uh, following the results of the forum. Just in order to trigger discussion, probably it would make sense to understand where we are, we all understand that the pandemic not only just introduced its changes, but the world is now living in a totally new reality. In order to speak more specifically, let's watch a movie prepared by a young film studio, Lian Film Star Pictures, Why Star? But you picture. Well, Let's discuss English afterwards, but may we have this video on the screen? The pandemic expedited the change of the world, social inequality, Fair social support, offline life, sped up digitalization, carbon economy, green economy, the man for the economy. or the economy for the man.
the economic policy has to embrace the new reality, and the new reality requires structural changes. How will Russia adapt? Russia, in the upcoming decades, environmental responsibility, budgetary rules, preparedness of the economy for the energy transition, favorable urban environment for 50% of cities, the hazardous emissions has to be cut two times. Environmentally friendly transport, social responsibility. Five million of families and households are improving their housing conditions. High speed uh, internet, uh, embrace 100% of the territory. Availability and affordability of the primary health care. 1,300 new schools are opened, 7,300 schools are re repaired. The poverty rate reduced two times by means of supporting the most vulnerable groups of people, responsibility of the authorities. The authorities uh, are responsible, are responding to the requests of the citizens, all online. The authorities uh, are helping development of business, especially SMEs, ESG stands for Sustainable Development for the Man. New opportunities for the man. Moscow Financial Forum, the Russian economy and uh, financial markets, sustainable development in the changing world. Risks and, in essence, uh, the image of the future, which we have seen now. My first question goes to Mr. Subyanin. We understand what grave problems Moscow faced. And, in essence, you were the one to find the balance between the fight for the life and health of people social well-being of the people on the other hand, development of the economy and uh, keeping business intact. Uh, this is the third asset. Share your experience. What do you think? How we find this balance between what's been done and the how to do that in future in order to came up with the image of the future which uh, has been presented to us. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Makarov. Bearing in mind that I'm the only non-financier on that podium and others are professional financial guys who spent lots of years and efforts on the financial matters. I would like to say, and certainly I associate myself with the words of congratulations by Mr. Mishustin on the professional financial holiday. I would say that this is the only detachment of people, the only group of people who is taking care of other people's money, who is saving up other people's money. And surprisingly, no one is grateful to them for that. I must say that today, these are not the fin Ministry of Finance uh, employees who are celebrating that day. A lot of people are being involved uh, in that industry. Moscow is one of the regional financial centers, a very powerful one. And this is a professional holiday of the people who are supporting not only the macroeconomic stability, not only the budgetary management and governance, but this is a holiday of the people who are running the insurance companies, uh, financial organizations, etc. On behalf of the non-financiers, uh, let me express my words of gratitude to you and words of congratulation. No one is thanking you. I just took advantage of this opportunity to do that. Speak about the decisions that we have to take amid the pandemic. The question which you have asked probably is the key one, because doctors know very well how to fight uh, the pandemic, what restrictive measures to introduce, how to keep people 
apart from each other how to prevent uh, infections, but uh, at the same time they are not knowledgeable about the financial issues, whereas the financiers know how to support business, how to develop economy, but they do not know how to treat people. They do not know what measures are necessary today, which have to be taken today in order to prevent the spread of the hotbeds of COVID-19. If you ask them individually, they would say, we have to close everything, lock everything down, not letting people out of their homes, or otherwise they can be hit and run by a car, and they'd rather stay at home and never go to the streets amid the pandemic. As far as the pandemic lasts for a year and a half, you can imagine how it would look like. All economists are saying, no, it's a nonsense, let's open up everything, let people make their own choices and do whatever they want, and we'll keep economy afloat. And the government and the president and the regional authorities, they have to weigh in both perspectives and to arrive to some kind of compromise solution, which on one hand would be able to ensure the population health and the guaranteed medical assistance to the population, but on the other hand, not to nip the economy in the bud and, uh, and not to uh, shrink people's uh, incomes and, and, and jobs, and, and as well as to maintain a uh, psychological well-being of our citizen. So it is between these two uh, poles that we are trying to strike a balance. Each country is taking its own set of measures and reacting to the crisis in their own way. We have decided to uh, use this kind of a limited uh, set of um, restrictive measures, enabling us uh, in our economy to function uh, just, just normally at a 90% capacity. On the other hand, when we see some big threats, we are taking local specific measures, enabling us to offset these processes and to uh, put down the peak of um, of uh, COVID. We make this type of decisions to make sure that our healthcare system would cope with the situation whenever we see that there is a, a spike in uh, COVID cases and we are in a situation that the healthcare system may collapse only then, only then we uh, induce some restrictive measures. Again, it's a very specific situation, just enough to uh, put down this spike. So on one hand, we are guaranteeing each uh, resident of Moscow some medical assistance if they caught the disease. But on the other hand, we've done all we could to make sure that the urban economy continues to flourish. And the same uh, the same logic is applied throughout the country. We can see that the Russian economy and the regional economies have uh, suffered uh, to a less extent unless we pursued a different policy. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sergey. And on behalf of the financial community, I'm referring to Alexei Kudrin. And it looks like he has something to say. And just before Alexei Kudrin will mm, speak on behalf of the whole community, we should not uh, forget that this, uh, this celebration of the Day of Financier has been celebrated for 10 years straight. Uh, Alexei, the floor is yours. Actually, you were the one who initiated this celebration. Dear friends, once again, congratulate you on the Day of Financier. And it was my final accord, so to speak. I had signed these presidential decree just before I left my office and today all of us actually not today but especially today we can celebrate uh, this day with our business successes and as well as to have a holiday and to uh, greet one another once again I would like to extend my congratulations with this holiday it's uh, in a way a paying tribute to this to this highly uh, specialized profession which requires one to have very high level of competence what I would like to say today, we have been speaking about the crisis and what has been done in the city of Moscow is unprecedented. I can attest to that. And again, this crisis of uh, COVID-19 is not over yet. Although in this year of 2021, many countries will attain the pre-crisis GDP level and our country will not 
or has not been an exception. And actually, the rest of the world will eventually overcome the crisis. And for Europe, it's going to take uh, another year of 2022. This will be the year when they will overcome these crisis developments. So crisis is still about, and speaking about the uh, air transportation, it's only 50% of the pre-crisis level. No. Now, automotive transportation is only 25% from its uh, pre-crisis level. FDI, foreign direct investment, have uh, slumped by 40%. In the USA, by 50%. Europe is basically came down to zero. In Russia, we had, we had had an outflow or decrease of the foreign direct investments. So I believe, I believe that uh, it's hard to say that we have overcome uh, crisis to the f to the full, but. This crisis uh, is unprecedented. It is not following the mechanisms of uh, our conventional crises when you have to stop or put to stop the whole regions, when you have to impose lockdowns on, on different regions. Well, successful companies obviously cannot work. They cannot carry on their regular economic activities, even if the demand is very high. The supply chains are being broken in some regions are getting out of this um, kind of supply chains and you know that the we have the uh, global uh, deficit global shortage of the semiconductors and a lot of electronic produce and energy sector produce and aerospace and automotive products are not going to hit the markets on time we are speaking about seven to nine uh, million uh, passenger cars which will be the market shortage in this sense the crisis this crisis does not have this kind of cleansing effect which usually crises have. So in this sense, we have to be ready for more uncertainty, for a higher flexibility to make sure that this kind of very unconventional crisis in its problems, the crisis which is not cleansing in the sense that it does not separate efficient companies from inefficient. So this is much bigger challenge that we're facing today. Thank you, Alexei. Actually, you you have brought us to the next issue. I believe it has a huge impact. Whenever we use the term macroeconomics, lately, for some reason, it has some kind of negative connotation. Well, macroeconomics, that means like a certain, certain pile of money that, uh, that Mr. Silvanov is sitting on the Russian finance ministry, that is. And actually, what we are seeing today is that in the world over, we can see the change in the macroeconomic policies. As a matter of fact, we are witnessing monetization of the public debt and the public deficits. Let's uh, put up a couple of slides on the screen. Number one, please, first. Please uh, see it. It's the public debt by countries. In one year, speaking of developed countries, it has grown from 70 to over 121 percent, speaking about the public debt of developed countries. And please follow with the second slide. And this is the situation in the US, EU, uh, UK, and Japan. The Federal Reserve System bought back 50 percent of the federal bonds. European Central Bank, 71 percent. Japan, 75 percent buyback of the federal bonds. Actually, in this sense, I have a question. Is it true that we have sort of like a new fad, a new fashion for um, such a macroeconomic policy? So maybe now we have a different perspective on uh, economic truths, which uh, Alexei had taught us about. But Alexei, I wanted to ask you again. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm asking Maxim Areshkin, the, the assistant to the president of the Russian Federation, I would like to second all these greetings with the day of financier in Russia. Well, speaking of the Russian crisis, actually, it has been, it continues. Again, it's an uh, unprecedented crisis. So again, the standard policy measures are no longer working in COVID-19. Had we all been using the old economic textbooks, the depth and the length of this crisis would be much more severe. And we've seen changes in some approaches, changes in the way different countries were tackling the crisis. But again, the basic principles of economic policies have not changed. We have some standard elements such as managing the aggregate demand, um, the managing the demand structure and uh, managing economic efficiency. These are the main pillars. But again, we have some things which uh, are very important uh, in the sense that we have to learn this lesson. 
And I believe that these uh, lessons are crucial to make sure that we do not uh, do as many mistakes in the future. Number one, number one, it's a new uh, realization that the macroeconomic response to the crisis should be commensurate with the size of economic problems. That is, if you have the deepest recession since World War II, your response should be uh, just equal. So I believe that Russia had found its optimal size and volume of uh, stimuli, which enabled us to recover our economic activity in less than a year. For example, speaking about the U.S., which have the budget deficit of 15 percent of the GDP for two years straight. When, when I think Anton is listening to something like that, like 15 percent of the budget deficit annually, probably there was an overstimulation in the U.S., which resulted in the global wave of inflation. Well, the second outcome or a lesson is that the macroeconomic policy tools and, and managing aggregate demand, you have to you have to use them differently in different situations. And that's why we use the active use of the budgetary stimuli because the monetary policy in these kind of short periods of time cannot provide for the very rapid uh, effect impacting demands. So using budget uh, stimulation and by supporting lending in the country and by direct payments to the people's physical accounts. This, all of these enabled us to achieve maximum effects. And thank God, if you look at the Russian situation, what were the main things which helped the Russian economy recover? First of all, it was a subsidized mortgage um, program. Secondly, uh, direct payments to companies and to citizens, which has been decided by the Russian president in the last year. And my third conclusion is that on the, as we had been emerging from the crisis, it was very important how the demand structure has been changing, and it will define the the rate of um, economic recovery. Unlike the first two points or lessons, I have some questions for the Russian situation, and maybe in the next quarters and months this has to be adjusted. But the current problem is that, speaking of those demand elements, what we are seeing is that the consumer lending is fueling, fueling growth. It's my favorite topic. And Throughout this pandemic year, this bubble has burst. And in August alone, in our country, 647 billion Russian rubles have, have been issued in the form of the, uh, of the consumer lending. And this is more than all payments to Russian citizens. So this is what is changing the demand structure in the Russian economy. And uh, this is moving it from the investment um, lending to the consumer lending. And this is why. When you manage the demand structure, this is something important, and this is what we have to do in this current moment. Once again, you cannot have just a cookie cutter solution or universal answers in economic policies nowadays. And using medical terms, you have to uh, you have to provide the right diagnosis, so to speak, and we have to understand how the economic works. And once you know what's going on, you can apply relevant solutions. In the last year, Russia has made a lot of right decisions, enabling our economy to recover after this like heavy blow of the pandemic. Thank you. Anton, in your perspective, speaking about the future of macroeconomic policy, this is a decisive factor of all that Sergei Sobyanin has been speaking in Alexei Kudrin have been saying, this is what is going to define the people's uh, quality of life and development of our economy. What is your perspective on this? Well, my perspective is as follows, that you cannot cheat uh, economic laws. You cannot always just go and print money and not to pay for this printing later on in your economy, because because for these huge emissions and high inflation which falls, who is paying for that? Usually uh, citizens of a country are paying for that, and primarily those who have limited incomes. So. This kind of policy cannot be pursued longer. It's a dead end. And we're seeing that most of the countries have begun to curtail their uh, stimulation, budgetary stimulation me measures. And indeed, speaking about the USA, uh, United States are still uh, continuing on this course. But you cannot do this forever. This is obvious, right? And my question is the following. Will this type of policy result in pumping up economy with money and uh, will provide additional 
point of growth. Some numbers for you. As I was getting ready for our meeting today, I would like to give you some ideas. For example, Canada, the country of Canada, they have the big budgetary uh, impulse or incentive. Their budget has grown by the factor of uh, 1.5. And the inflation, they got inflation, they got the decrease of the rate of growth of economy of more than 5.5 uh, percentage per annum. Again, the similar situation is happening in some other countries, including Brazil. Speak of China. The increase in the budget in 2020 was less than 3%. And by the way, the in, in Russia, it's about plus 25%. So in China, there was a budgetary increase by 3% by the economy grew of more than 5.5%. Yes, you can give another example. The country of Turkey, the inflation is 19%, one nine. The rates for the economy and for the state would be 16 to 18%. And uh, the Turkish lira has uh, devalued by 25%. And looking at this result, and supposedly it provides some positive effect, but you have to do it uh, to do it in a very weighted, in very calculated manner, because any mistake in this kind of stimulation may may result in people well-being living in uh, respective countries. So I believe that Russia. We've tried to have a very weighted and very careful approach in using these monetary factories and and try to be very careful about budgetary spending. And it is not a coincidence that as we are drafting budget for the next three-year period, we are attaining the normal level of our budgetary policy. And this is most importantly, which gives us assurance that even entrepreneurs seeing what the government is doing in the country, they may plan their business strategies and make their business plans. And it gives them confidence that this kind of tempo which we have right now as our economy is getting out of this kind of pandemic slump and slowdown, and this new dynamic will continue. Thank you, Anton. Actually, both you and Maxim Oreshkin have used, have used such a word as inflation. I would say it's a scary word, inflation. Inflation as a certain outcome of those policies which have been pursued, but for our conversation to be more specific and if we uh, move from the Canadian example and and kind of plant ourselves in in the Russian soil so to speak let's look at the third slide it's the current inflation and the targeted inflation you've been speaking about that this is what is going on with our inflation I think speaking about the history of the USA in Germany and the EU we haven't seen this type of inflation anywhere in history, it was simply impossible even to fathom that this could be a possibility. Can you please show the graph number four? This would be the indexes for the commodities. We're seeing uh, the price indexes for commodities. This is what's going on with those uh, commodities which have colossal importance for us, I mean for the Russian economy, because again, we know this is what is going on with the prices on the metals, on the wood. And this is the cause of those facilities and buildings which are being erected within the Russian national projects. Again, it impacts the cost of the bridges and, and hospitals, you name it. Maxim, I'm intentionally now speaking about inflations of commodities and how the commodity inflation impacts our economy. But again, my next question will be about uh, food inflation, which is impacting kind of regular people. Let's separate these two. What are we going to do with those in the in the light of what you've been saying? It's a question both for you, for Anton, and for Maxim. What do you offer? Well, speaking about inflation separately, the commodity inflation and food inflation, that's very difficult because first of all, what it all started with. Okay, okay. Just to ease your task, uh, show us please the chart number five. What we're missing, chart number five, inflation in Russia, and we'll find out that inflation for food products is like that. Well, in August, unfortunately, the non-food products uh, inflation index uh, surpassed uh, the one of the food products. This is 
And the same process which started with the food, then uh, translated in non-food products. This is the natural reaction of the global economy on uh, the emissions, on the soft uh, quantitative easing. And uh, this is the process which is not over. Even in the food sector, we see that the process for wheat and for sunflower oil went up and has been supported by different um, estimates uh, for uh, how the yield would look like in different areas of the world. This is something which we'll have to face in future. What set of measures are being offered? The monetary measures which have been implemented by the Bank of Russia, there are non-monetary measures which are being implemented by the government in the food markets. Uh, there would be certain dampers which are related to the flexible change of the expert uh, duties something to help us to prevent uh, the impact of the fluctuation in the external prices on the domestic ones, but we cannot offset uh, these fluctuations we're working under the conditions of uh, the open economy. We find ourselves in the UAEU, the borders are open, means that we cannot uh, calibrate that uh, with uh, the expert duties. We have to comply with the WTO rules. Our capacity is limited. And let us be frank, it is very important to uh, one scrub of the inflation, we should not ruin the market institutional basis of our economy. We should not be detrimental to the incentives for the investments. This is what we know historically that uh, very often such a regulation may translate into budget deficits. And certainly the government takes all these measures, bearing in mind the long-term ramifications and consequences. Therefore, we focus on the market mechanisms, on long-term tendencies. Hence, we have a very serious challenge in front of us. Expert duties for metals, which were introduced initially, we thought that uh, they would be short term until the end of the year, and this is why now we have to offer the standing mechanisms using the tax instruments in order to fine tune our economy, to fine tune that to address these peak periods, that the budget would act as the main damper, as the main cushion. Once we see such a sharp rise in the commodities, commodity prices, forest prices, steel prices, we could actually compensate for the construction costs. We can expand the consumer support measures and uh, generally speaking, and the Mr. Mishustin spoke about that the social treasury mechanism is about uh, fine tuning of our social measures as well. This is the process which uh, goes on. This is something which we have to Bear in mind that now easy solutions in fighting inflation. Once taking decision, we have to bear in mind the long-term incentives, long-term rules. Business is very much concerned about uh, the predictability of the measures which are being taken, and we have to bear that in mind. Thank you so much. Mr. Silonov, are you eager to add something? Well, inflation in Russia has been impacted heavily by the global processes. And I think that we have to mix it uh, and somehow soften that or mitigate that for the citizens who suffer from the high inflation rate more than anyone else. Well, we're looking, uh, we're living in a globalized world. What I'd like to draw attention to is that the prices grew dramatically, especially for commodities. Commodity prices grew up, food prices grew up dramatically. Russia is one of the biggest exporters uh, of commodities and food products as well. There are two things I'd like to mention. First of all, we have to control the rise in prices for our citizens so that uh, the Inflation rate doesn't go beyond uh, the scope which we have set for ourselves, and therefore we are using some restrictive measures such as uh, cushions, expert uh, duties. But the second thing is that the exporters, uh, traditional exporters, 
who today got extra revenue from the hike in prices, have to share this profit. We have to earmark this money to support the citizens. Well, we have heard about that somewhere. Well, I'm not speaking about uh, the percentage. We have to earmark this money to support these people who suffer from inflation rate. This is what has been done. These huge resources. So 700 billion uh, is earmarked to support uh, school children and vulnerable people, pensioners and uh, the servicemen. This money we got thanks to the hike in the global prices. But once again, let me reiterate, for us it is very important that the global situation does not impact, it does not uh, hit the people who cannot bear heavy costs. We have to support them. The main objective of the government is to provide for control and mechanisms to set up necessary instruments and tools in order to ensure the decent uh, inflation rate, which will not bring down the real income of the people. We have to get the revenues that we get. This is my main idea. Mr. Rushetnikov, Mr. Rishkin, well, um, the diagnosis is uh, what uh, matters. Uh, the inflation rate is being boosted by actually the external factors. Uh, uh, the United States uh, boasted 15% of rise in its GDP because of printing more money. And you cannot just use market uh, mechanisms to cope with that. It's very easy to determine whether an inflation is being boosted by domestic factors or external factors. Uh, once, actually, uh, it is uh, driven by the domestic factors, then uh, the exchange rate is changing and uh, not the products which are traded uh, in the international market uh, are rising in prices, but uh, the ones which are traded domestically. Therefore, the reaction to the external inflation should be about supporting the citizens. And uh, President Putin, uh, speaking in front of United Russia, discussed that in every detail, and a uh, decision was taken to pay benefits to the school children to the pensioners. Uh, President Putin uh, highlighted this uh, vast uh, package of uh, payouts. Uh, it's going to be expanded. Uh, this is one of the measures uh, proposed by United Russia to support uh, families with kids. And for sure, it will be done. Priority number one is uh, to take care, take care of the most vulnerable people who suffer from the change in process. And the second thing. We have to look at the inflation rate uh, driven by the external demand. What are the most efficient measures? The global situation and the Russian uh, situation is uh, not conventional. Uh, therefore, the conventional measures cannot bring about uh, stabilization. For instance, uh, the consumer lending. Uh, measures can give us uh, more opportunities for other types of lending and therefore the economy can get out of the current situation more efficiently. So the efficient use of uh, the tools of the economic uh, mechanism which are available and supporting of people, these are the two solutions. Well, Mr. Rushetnikov, probably there is something that I missed. I wanted to show one more slide by the organizers told me not to do that. I looked at uh, the prices rise, rise in prices for timber, for metals until fifth February 2021, the year of COVID. Uh, the prices did not change, whereas starting from February, uh, the prices skyrocketed. I tried to understand what special happened uh, on, in February that the metal prices would skyrocket, and I see that uh, the contracts are being terminated. Uh, the biddings are no longer there. The business says uh, the products grew in process so dramatically. We cannot cope with that, but 
Why? Why is it? I was speaking about the missed opportunity, something that business is highlighting, where these are the real processes driven by the fact that the business has to do that. Once we speak about the lost opportunity, then uh, Mr. Silonov is right, saying that we all find ourselves in a crisis situation. We have to fight to combat uh, the consequences and ramifications of COVID-19. And probably we should not be guided by uh, this uh, trying to grasp uh, the uh, lost opportunity. I don't see any other factors uh, that would drive uh, the metal prices um, so high in February. Well, that's the question of the values. Are we standing up for the market economy? Well, business now benefits more from selling abroad. We are an open economy. What other options we have? How else we can combat that. We have introduced the expert duties in order to bridge this gap. And this is a temporary thing. Other mechanisms, this is a question for us. Our public con contracts uh, are not flexible. These hike in prices certainly have a say on our revenue. So we have um, better tax collection and uh, the economy will grow by 4.2%, and this is a conservative forecast. We'll get some extra revenue, and part of that money actually has to be earmarked in order to bring down the costs of uh, the construction. But uh, we don't have a flexible mechanism to adapt for that situation. We have to somehow fine-tune our contracts, our system uh, to adapt for such situations, because such things are very much uh, possible in the future. We have uh, somehow to amend the Federal Law 44, not only to hedge the customers' risks, we have uh, to uh, somehow amend the tax regulation uh, so that the extra profits that we get have to be earmarked on the investments in order to offset the hike in the prices somehow. When discussing the prices, certainly we aim at uh, social stability, aim at uh, stability of prices uh, for food for our citizens, but we have to stay within the paradigm of the market economy. This crisis uh, is uh, testing our basics, our foundations. Thank you so much. And I imagine uh, being a member in this dispute whether the market uh, mechanisms have to be contradictory to such notions as uh, consciousness, for instance. But I'm a moderator. But you spoke about the companies, you spoke about the business. Let's have a look at one more slide, chart number six. It speaks about the profits and investments of the Russian companies. So the profits are going up along with the metal prices, whereas investments are usually being made by the state. And you know about that. We didn't show how much money the companies store on the deposits. So the state creates very favorable conditions for the companies to invest, but they prefer to save this money on the deposits. So once, actually, the rank and file people are storing the money on their deposits, uh, that's clear. This is something we can account for. But I remember that each of you, our dear panelists, said that the public investments may get, give this necessary impetus, but cannot substitute for the private investments. Bear in mind this money. What can we do? Mr. Subyanian, let's proceed from theory to practice. My question goes to you. In Moscow, the companies do invest. What's the secret behind that? Whereas uh, country-wise, the situation is very much different. Well, the volume of investments into the fixed capital, for instance, uh, 
against uh, 2019 grew by 20 percent. Last year we had uh, some fall, 1 percent fall. That's uh, the statistical margin. I disagree with the fact that the companies are not ready to invest. Uh, it matters where they are eager to invest their money. The companies are very much eager to invest once the project is profitable. Quite recently, we implemented one of the projects of uh, uh, developing a former industrial zone. And we started the bidding with the minimum amount, believing that our investors will be reluctant to join us. Well, 80 percent of that project would be about the public development and uh, rehabilitating the industrial facilities. And we got, uh, we brought together more than 2,000 investors, and uh, the bidding price went 80 times up. So the matter is uh, what product you offer to investors. Secondly, we have to understand uh, what economic model we are developing, what economy is ready to consume the investments. For instance, Germany, the German economy. Uh, Germany is an industrial country. But if you look at the structure of the economy, According to different estimates, uh, 70 to 80 percent of the German economy uh, accounts for services, not production. Whereas we in Russia try to invest all the money into the manufacturing, not into the industry, uh, industrial output. It is not uh, that we do not need manufacturing, but uh, the economic structure has changed. Uh, the services offer the best payback, and in order to invest into the services, uh, we have to consume the services a concentrated way, and the concentrated consumption of services occur only where we have uh, densely populated areas, and the less density of population there, the less investments are being made into the modern economy, and that's a very simple answer. Therefore. In big cities, investments uh, do not go down because the density of the population is quite high. Investments into the public catering or into hotels or hospitality will give you better pay off and pay back rather than investment in the rural areas. There are no surprises. We have to set up necessary infrastructure, preparing the uh, projects, co-funding engineering, transportation infrastructure, legislation have to be provided, and uh, certain urban uh, regulation has to be offered. We have to address the problem of red tape. But at the same time, we have to understand that uh, the investments uh, will not go up once you use uh, the uh, regular methods. Usually, urban or regional economies uh, will not, will never live the way they used to live before. We have to think about how to provide the necessary and biased uh, conditions for the rise in the investments. Uh, uh, development of big cities and uh, denser population, this is what we need. Well, thank you so much, Mr. Subyanin. In essence, you have touched upon a question of a commodity-based economy, the future economy, this is something which we have to discuss. But uh, look at Mr. Shetnik, if I understand that if I do not pass the floor to him to react to what I said about the business, will be die-hard enemies. Mr. Shetnik, over to you. Well, actually, I did not get to your uh, diatribe. Well, I was thinking about the structural changes raised by Mr. Sobyanian. Well, will the huge public investments, which were mentioned by Mr. Sulanov, by you, by Mr. Mishustin, will they be followed by the private investments, or will they, because the budget is going to invest and the business uh, will keep saying, just give us money, or give us a loan, 
in the worst case scenario and we are ready to run a risk at your expense forgetting that business this is about entrepreneurship and every entrepreneur acts at his or her own expense and now actually the business is ready to shift all the risks to the shoulders of the state well i see that now we have a live discussion well in the first six months uh, the investments grew 7.3 percent and this is not just because of the public investments let me put that uh, straightforward let's look at this structure of costs etc business is investing heavily can invest uh, uh, more subtly Therefore, we are amending the legislation. Therefore, we offer new mechanisms and investment protection mechanisms. Now we have more opportunities in the framework of the tax policy. We can somehow promote these issues and these measures. But what we have, what do we have to understand? When we exit from the crisis, usually the state is uh, showing the leadership in investments, and from this standpoint. We've made a lot of decisions, not only about budgetary investments, but also some budgetary investments which are forwarded to the Russian regions. And before uh, 2023, half a billion in loans will not only be issued, but it will be utilized for business. But half a trillion, not half a billion, right? Yes, I'm sorry, half a trillion. And we have to restructure the money before the federal budget, 600 million, so we have the whole menu. And speaking about the regional investments alone, which have been, which have been amounted to uh, 1.5 trillions, and of course some part of the uh, National Welfare Foundation money will be spent to the national projects. Um, this 1.5 trillion Russian rubles, and as uh, instructed by the Russian government, we're working through financial models. And by 2022, we want to put this money to business because this forecast of the 3% growth in 2022 makes sense and it has been confirmed. But for the years, years 2023 and 2024, keeping the rate of 3% will depend on, on spinning this kind of new investment wheel. But I do not think that the Russian business is not ready to invest. Yes, the structure of investments is going to change. Not only investing in industries and cities, but also investing in IT. And looking at the structure of investments, we can see that we have seen the twofold increase in IP rights, speaking about the IT system and so forth. So this investment process is ongoing. Thank you, Maxim Reshetikov. Yes, when Sergei Sobyanin has been answering your question, he was speaking about the infrastructure, but this volume of infrastructure investments that Moscow has been done in the last 10 years. I think it has been unprecedented. Never before in the history of Moscow have we had this kind of investments. And all these investors came not for nothing. Some would like to build the subway and Moscow Circle Road and um, upgrading infrastructure, and then investors came. So answering your question, Andrei. When all over Russia, in each Russian region, so will have the same capabilities and the same infrastructure investments, you will see private investments which will follow the government investments. Well, after this kind of uh, very peaceful words, I absolutely have to give the floor again to Alexei Kudrin. Yeah, I'll be very short. I fully agree with uh, Sergei Semyonov and Maxim Reshetnikov, but I will say the following. It is not uh, private companies and private sector are responsible for underfinancing. I, I think back to year 2000 and on when the volume of investments have been jumping up to 15 and 20 percent in some years. I remember how the structure of investments has been changing towards design, logistics, and and service sector, and so on. Well, basically, speaking about the companies, you know, it's very, very profitable for them to invest because they make money, but they would like to invest in something which will provide them the good return on investments. And that means that they do not see the industries suitable for investing. Or today we have some uh, poor investment climate. It's about the uh, application of law, the regulation framework. And in this sense, you can continue this list of limiting factors. And as of today, I believe we have to make a very step forward. It's about a uh, competition policy. 
when you think about our national projects and national problems, we are creating new state corporations. And this whole we have the whole bunch of state corporations in Russia. And if you try to do something new, you always have to go back to this kind of public-run uh, state corporations, which is stifling. And I believe that we need to decrease the number of uh, public sector in the economy. We have to give more freedom, more breathing air to private business and private companies. And I believe that this will be the factor which will impact the volume of private investments in Russia. And Anton Siloanov, I know that we're all kind of stirred up with this topic. What I would like to say is I would like to refer to your graph we can see on the screen that the capital investments are lagging behind from the cash flow of uh, companies. And this differential, this, this uh, gap is widening. And in 2021, we can see it growing. I am confident that this gap, this gap is more specific to the raw material companies, which are getting a huge rent and they're not reinvesting these profits. They're living well because they have this kind of rental revenue. You get some iron ore, you sell it overseas, you, you then you make some kind of semi products and you sell them over in okay you get the good rent you get the good money coming in much has been said about some extra revenues uh, of the metal working companies and those who are involved in the non ferrous metals and some other industries this is truly so because we can see they have more uh, cash flow their operational cash flow have doubled have tripled in some occasions or even more. And these uh, operation cash flows are more than investments. Let's say that they have this tractor running on the quarry and they're collecting this iron ore and exporting it or selling it within the Russia. Why would they invest in anything else? You want them to invest in radio electronics? They do not have competences for it trying to invest in hydrogen production. Why would you do this if you have very good cash flow in your company? So having a huge kind of rent, huge uh, natural resources income, they pay it out in the form of dividends. Yes, the Russian government is getting its uh, profit income, but these kind of huge revenues are being dissipated and being sent over to dividends. So we have to look into this. When we speak about this kind of process in companies, if they have like a super revenues and they get additional additional price revenues, well, we have to distribute this kind of rental income. How do you distribute in the new economy? And we have to help those companies. Like today, Alexei Kudrin has been speaking they would like to invest, but they're seeing risks in the Russian economy. They can see not enough uh, ROI coupled with risks and and maybe their financial model is not playing out well. So the Russian government has to help these new uh, sectors of the economy. Yes. Maybe it's about some type of financial resources. Maybe sometimes we have to help them with the infrastructure. Maybe even to co-finance some projects. But anyway, we have to. We have to utilize private money today and to be able to uh, invest or reinvest these private money. We have to do this, keeping in mind that the Russian government has to provide some preferences or even to invest some public money, which could be redistributed from this kind of uh, super rental uh, natural resources mining companies. So I believe that it's also the global trend. But you can no longer have your free running liberal economy with a zero involvement in, in, of, of, of the state. It does not work anymore. Today, you need some governmental vision, guidance of the key uh, economic sectors. Today, the state has to support companies. So this is the structure which I believe will be efficient and effective. Uh, Sergei Sobyanin, do you have anything to say? Yeah, I would like to say the following. Yes, I second what, um, what uh, Anton Silonov is saying that uh, about those companies with the highest EBITDA, but, but, it is not only about the huge revenues of these kind of uh, uh, processing industries or extractive companies. I think it's a, it's a utopia. They're not going to reinvest into different sectors because they are not professionals. But at the same time, we have to stimulate those uh, those uh, companies for uh, to process these uh, raw materials. 
that they will have a more high, higher technological order. So we have to provide the tax and the custom systems as such for them to stimulate uh, for the deprocessing of these uh, natural minerals and resources. Uh, speaking about the petrochemical um, industries and, and the metal mining industries. So you have to provide this kind of stimuli for these companies, which will um, create the investment flows into deprocessing of these mined minerals. And people say, OK, you have a raw material economy. Nothing shameful about it. but." Uh, but we have to process these raw materials. So we have to stimulate the extractive companies to do this. And only government can do this, to push them into more kind of high technological order of uh, process. But today, today, uh, it is very profitable for them to export their products. It's a problem. You've all raised, I believe, the main, the main theme, the main issue. The world has changed. And today, more and more experts are saying, that this kind of era in the time of the hydrocarbons is uh, is uh, passing by. It's becoming the thing of the past, even though the, the prices are very high today. But more global experts are saying that this kind of era of uh, hydrocarbons is behind us. We are coming into the new era. I'm not even going to show you the graphs of the global demand for oil today. But anyway, what do you think? What are the risks? as we have been discussing today, this kind of new new taxes and the new uh, global regulations of those things which were considered to be the domestic affairs of each country. But today we have some risks and probably opening up for some opportunities. What is your perspective on what has been mentioned right now, be it a raw material economy like Ser Sergei Sabianin has been saying it, the fact that we have some, some uh, some minerals. It's great, right? I think it would be madness to say that uh, it's kind of curse that you have kind of oil and gas minerals and other minerals in the country. But we have to uh, we have to uh, reckon with some risks. It's it's absolutely interesting. Can we just give the bullet points, very short answers? What is your vision of the risks and opportunities of the future, uh, Maxim? Do you mind to be first? We would like you to be the first one to. Uh, to, you know, run out of the trenches, so to speak, into the enemy fire. Well, it's difficult to be brief speaking about the low carbon economy and many countries having this kind of discourse and discussion right now. But it looks like it's a restaurant menu without prices pinned down on this menu. People say sun and wind and the green, uh, green economy, then hydrogen, giving up coal, giving up uh, internal combustion engines, and so forth. Yet no one is saying how much is going to cost and who is going to pay for it. What we are seeing today and calculating, we think that the super fast implementations of the low carbon agenda may entail the global inflation. Why? Because it means that the energy will become much more costly. It, it's going to be a big structure rebuilding. It, these are big investments, and somebody is going to pay for these investments. Of course, this is not to say that, that this is not going to happen. It is going to happen. But again, we have to be very pragmatical, pragmatical and cautious in pursuing these policies. We always have to calculate, calculate each step. And yes, we do have threats related to exports of the Russian minerals. We have been saying about that. And also we have some capabilities. And these capabilities about the new technological agenda, hydrogen economy and uh, self-driving or electric cars and uh, renewable energy sources. And this is where we could be competitive in the world today. At the same time, we have some capabilities and opportunities in conventional fields, like in the oil and gas, in, in coal uh, generation, in gas. And this is the case when the two tourists are running, escaping the barrier. It is not about escaping a bear. You have to run faster than the second tourist will be devoured by this bear, the joke goes. So we have to be more efficient, as they had been discussing at the Far Eastern Economic Forum. We have to decrease the carbon footprint of our industry. We have to make our fuel and energy complex more efficient. And probably at some point in time, we will have some new niches and this spike of the like coal prices, which we are witnessing today, and the increase in the export is also the sequence of the climate agenda, however strange it may sound. Simply, if we have an accelerated, accelerated, giving up the coal 
it can lead us into this kind of situation. What are the lessons? Number one, we have to have very proactive internal agenda and policies. We have it. We have adopted this new legislation. And these would be so-called regional experiments. So one will be held in the, on the island of Sakhalin. It will be a payment with this CO2. We're launching experiments. It's also about very proactive policies on the external markets at the Glasgow and working with the WTO and also very detailed calculation and communication with the business community and, uh, and population what it's going to cost and who will be paying for that. My only request, could you please in your answer mention like now we have been speaking about opportunities for different industries. Let's take the uh, next 25 years. Labor productivity in Russia has grown significantly in the last 25 years. It's a, like a 91% increase, but in China in the same time period, which is 25 years, it has grown by the factor of 6. In, in, in India, 3.2, by the factor of 3.2. Could you please just combine these two issues? Because I'm under impression that many problems we are trying to deal with and trying to solve in Russia, not due to increased labor productivity and trying to boost it, but let's let's make another tax regime in Russia. Let's do this or that. Well, my answer is very simple. Compared to China, I can even refer to the first question about the macroeconomics. Like many people are saying, using non-conventional approaches in different countries, it has been happening in China. Emerging from the crisis of uh, 2008, using the governmental leverage, they have increased their uh, infrastructure investments. It is what Mr. Sabianin has been saying. This is actually the entry tickets into the boosted productivity and economic growth. Nothing will happen without this type of infrastructure investments. And this moment we're in, while we are having all these conversations about the energy transition, and who is scared today? Those who manufacture, not those who buy. That's why the prices have tripled in five years. People were so scared about these investments in the new economy. Now the, now the uh, supply cannot meet the demand. We have the huge prices. And for us, this is uh, a capability to use these resources again to invest into a deeper process of what Sergei Sabiani has been saying, and I'm fully supportive of that. Investing in infrastructure, investing in ecology is again the token of the future. If we will be successful, uh, successful in this maneuver, we're going to get a boost in productivity and labor productivity. Sergei Semyonovich, what is your key for the labor productivity in Russia? If labor productivity is not growing, you have to change statistics, right? Like sometimes they do, because it looks like we we pass this back to the Ministry of Economic Development and some other ministries, but nothing is happening in, uh, you know, like every joke has Every joke is only a partial joke. If you look at the dynamics of the labor productivity in, in Europe, it has dropped down. It has decreased in the big cities. Well, this is not the case because economy has shifted and the econo new economy is not cannot be measured by the older economic you know, measurements. If you provide economic services, you have less, co less costs. Less costs, less uh, productivity, but this is not the case. It's simply it's a different economy and has to be uh, it has to be measured by different markers. And we are still trying to measure the older economy, how many shoes we've done, how much oil we have produced and so forth. But the new economy is different and has to be measured differently. Otherwise, we're going to say that, OK, in New York, in London, in Milan, they have the decrease of labor productivity. Wow, check this out. But in Beijing, it is growing. But in the absolute indicators in Beijing, it's like uh, only half of the Moscow's indicators. You have to be careful here, except I would like to reiterate. It's a different economy today and bigger cities provide totally different impact. In Moscow, the labor productivity is double of that of, of Russia, but it does not mean that the Moscovites are working twice as much as the rest of people in Russia. Simply, the, their labor effect is bigger because they are providing services to bigger number of people and each hour of your working time is giving the boost to your productivity. Again, it's a new economy, it's a new measurements, and it's uh, about the new forecasts and the vision. So we have to have a different approach. Okay, Mr. Kudrin, over to you. 
let's forget about the labor productivity. I understand it, that uh, we'll change the statistics and it will look great. What's your recipe for the post-COVID economy? Thank you so much. I started speaking about uh, the features of the COVID crisis. One of the conclusions we can come up with is that the crisis doesn't give uh, the change in the structure of the economy. It doesn't trigger anything, but there are two or three factors. First of all, that's about digitalization. Uh, before the COVID-19, the companies who embarked on digitalization accounted for 16 percent of the GDP, but uh, throughout the pandemic, uh, the companies which completed uh, the digitalization actually accounted for 33 percent of the GDP. Uh, the World Bank believes that uh, soon it will be 50 to 50 percent. This is one of the factors accelerated by the pandemic. Industry 4.0, we believe that we are living in this context. But inside that Industry 4.0, there will be another um, revolution, the carbon-free industry, the transformations uh, that uh, the whole world awaits for can be compared to the combustion engine invention. Not because the combustion engine will be totally phased out and it will lose any sense in the framework of that revolution. Remember, we discussed actually how we can mitigate the climate change by reducing the CO2 emissions. We can debate that, but the world has taken a political decision. And we no longer are involved in the scientific debate. So once the EU and the United States took a decision that they will, they will reach carbon neutrality by 2050, this is their binding commitment. For instance, uh, Japan by 2050 will reach zero CO2 emissions and uh, China said that it will reach carbon neutrality by 2060, and Germany will do that by 2040. Russia has not made any announcements. It said that it would take a very cautious uh, approach, and probably we can even increase uh, coal mining. I think that we are lagging behind. We are late in doing that. Well, Mr. Kudrin, Russia said that its pure emissions would be less than in the EU net emissions. Well, uh, this is about the emissions plus capturing, carbon capturing. Well, probably will not decrease emissions so much. By 2050, probably will decrease that 1.5 times, but will expand the capturing capacity of the forests. Probably that's a mistake, but uh, we can discuss that. We can debate on that. I will explain why. The world will rule out the technologies which are being used in the energy sector at the moment, and therefore it will be very difficult for us to supply our hydrocarbons to the global markets. According to the carbon neutrality scenario, if Russia by 2050, even following the scenario proposed by the Ministry of Economic Development, will have to actually bring down the hydrocarbons experts by 60 to 70 uh, percent. Sorry to interrupt you, Mr. Kudrin. I think that only the eight of the president can do that, but uh, the State Duma representatives are present here as well. The matter is that uh, I think that carbon neutrality has to be discussed at a separate roundtable. Don't do that at the very end of the plenary session, and I'm deeply convinced that we'll have another opportunity to do that. We'll conclude at uh, carbon neutrality at Mr. Siluanov who will not have time and uh, we will not uh, learn what the Ministry of Finance uh, learned from that. So as the head of the Chamber of Accounts, I must say that uh, in the upcoming 10 decades, actually, we have uh, huge potential revenues uh, for the budget. Let's give the floor to Mr. Siluanov. One more statement I'd like to make. The structural challenge that uh, the Russian Federation is facing is connected to the fact that the world is going to share this pie of new technologies which are going to be offered to the energy sector and other industries. 
carbon footprint label is going to be placed on every product. And any person who is ready to help the environment will not have to collect garbage uh, separately. Just a person can be guided by these uh, carbon footprint labels in order to reduce uh, the scope of these points in order to help the world survive. That's a total new mechanism. This is a total new culture. In that sense, we can be late. We can be late for sharing this pie and sharing these technologies. You're absolutely right, Mr. Kudrin, but just in our Russian shops, uh, people are not guided by the footprint, but they're guided by the prices. And uh, they are matching that against their wages. Mr. Salamov, what do you think about that? In essence, we almost done with our discussion what uh, Mr. Mishustin, the Prime Minister, started with. And let me proceed from the knees where we listen to all the finance ministers and all the governors of uh, the central banks, uh, what they think about uh, the carbon footprint. And uh, there's no unanimity. There is a total chaos. Uh, just they agreed that they are going to set up a special task force dealing with that. But let us get back to our shops, to the shelves, and what we discussed. Well, speak about the carbon footprint. There is still some time we have to restructure our economy. We have 10 years in order to take advantage of the competitive age to make sure that our economy is not so much dependent on hydrocarbons. For corporates, for companies, uh, this is the time that they can um, refocus on something else, on non-commodity industry and the state, which uh, gets most of its revenues from hydrocarbons, can some shift uh, its investment programs in order to uh, address the uh, targets which have already been put forward, something which will help us to create new state-of-the-art companies and industries, and hence will have new, totally new sectors of the economy in order to offset the global tendency which we see. I mean, the dependence on uh, carbon. Therefore, this extra money would be earmarked to these new industries, new economic sectors, in order to create new jobs. The uh, Our goal is not to lose this momentum to perform our plans, and I'm sure that we follow the trend of the changes which are taking place in the world. Thank you so much. Colleagues, friends, in essence, the president put forward in front of us two main problems or objectives, uh, to raise the quality of living of the people and to competitiveness of the country. Today, among the panelists, you can find the people who were developing the solutions necessary in order to make this come true. I think that the biggest achievement of our panel discussion is that uh, these people, the panelists, share, shared their ideas, explaining why this or that decision was taken, what it is backed with. This is uh, necessary not only for the financial people, but for all the citizens of our country. End of our session, I'd like to thank everyone who have come to us. Thank you for your sincerity for being frank and open for sharing your ideas with us. Thank you so much, and congratulations on that holiday. And as Mr. Subyanian said, let the festivity go on.
Встречай Сбер. Твой банк. А еще Сбер – это целая вселенная. С универсальным доступом. Легко и просто. Выгодная подписка. На все сразу. Салют. Умный ассистент поможет выбрать фильм на вечер, поговорить о жизни. А ты хороша. Спасибо за комплимент, Андрей. А еще доставим, накормим, довезем. Что-то еще? Отправим, сориентируем, поможем бизнесу взлететь. С нами 100 миллионов клиентов. Такое кино, такие новости, такой звук. Сбер. Больше, чем банк. Сбер для жизни.